we've been talking about so many different things in this series, and today we have the special privilege of coming to the Lord's table, um, sometimes called the Sacred Supper. And what we've been learning in this series is we get to hear his voice, we have his ear, we belong to his body, and we learn in so many ways we grow the habits of grace or the means of grace. Today we come to one of those means of grace that is so clear in Scripture. But sometimes I think we just tack it on to the end of a service. And today I want to just walk through, I'm going to read for you something then out of Luke, and then we're going to look at 1 Corinthians. Because four different times in Scripture it talks about the Lord's table. We grow by remembering and giving thanks for what our Lord and Savior Jesus did for us on the cross. So if you have your Bibles, Luke chapter 22, and I'm going to begin reading it, verse 14. And when the hour came, Jesus reclined at the table and the apostles with him. And he said to them, I have earnestly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I tell you, I will not eat it until it is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. And he took a cup, and we had given thanks. He said, take this. Divided among yourselves, for I tell you that from now on I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. And he took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to them, saying, This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And likewise, the cup, after they had eaten, saying, This cup is poured out for you, is the new covenant in my blood. This is the word of the Lord. But remembering is really, really powerful sometimes, and I don't know if you guys read the books or watched the movies or the extended version of the movies, but in The Lord of the Rings, there is a, a scene in which Gandalf and one of the little hobbits, Pippin, um, are confronted with the witch of Angmar, the witch king of Angmar, and uh, at one point, he pulls out his sword, and this thing is just the, it's evil. It is evil. Well, I'll show you. It is, it's evil looking, and it knocks Gandalf off his horse, and then brave little Pippin steps up <laughs> with his sword. And it's actually kind of a funny scene. Um, he finds himself face to face with the witch king, this commander of darkness, and this beast. And I had to look up what they called this beast. It was called the uh, fell beast. And it, I mean, the thing is terrifying because his mouth is bigger than the poor little hobbit. And as soon as he sees it, he realizes it's over. This thing is eating me. I'm done. And it's getting ready. And, you know, the witch king says something. And it's going to be all over for, for Pippin. And then he hears something. I don't know if you guys know what it is that he hears. But he stares death in the face. And he hears the distant horns of Rohan. And when he hears these, this cavalry, these riders of Rohan come in to Pippin's aid, actually to kind of his salvation. And just from that point on, just remembering those horns, that sound. Because as soon as they sounded, this witch king took off to go battle. But it saved Pippin's life and he remembers that forever. Sometimes remembering things changes us. It can change us actually forever. And the Lord's table does that. It changes us and it helps us grow. And we're going to see a few things. What, what, this sacred supper, what, what happens? How does it change us? Well, one thing it does, it unites us. And it unites us to the past. It also unites our souls to God when we come to the table. The Sacred Supper also unites me and you, which is awesome. We'll see that in a minute. And then it unites us to the future. And you'll see so many things. As a matter of fact, one of the four things that the apostles were committed to doing right at the beginning of the church was to the apostles' teaching, to fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and to prayer. So one of the four things that the early church used all the time for growth was coming to the sacred supper. So this table, when we come to it, when we come to it today, it unites us, it unites the present to the past. And I'm going to read for you. In 1 Corinthians, Paul, he said, I received this from the Lord. 
and I think this is awesome because we learned this when we were in Galatians, that he wasn't with Jesus like the other disciples were. But we know that after that, Jesus actually taught Paul. As a matter of fact, in Galatians, he says, what I have received, I did not get from other men. I got directly from Jesus. So what I'm teaching you isn't something that I got third hand, fourth hand. It didn't come down to me. I heard it from Jesus. I'm communicating. So there's a boldness. And he is, what I received from the Lord, what I also passed on to you, the Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembering to me. We're going to do that. We're going to come to the Lord's table together. But it's also doing something amazing. It's connecting us to a past and then to a past. To the past is connecting us to right when Jesus was in that upper room with his disciples the night that he was going to be betrayed. And he was changing something. He was uniting that meal to even farther back, a Passover meal. And it's just so amazing because I want to kind of, you want to kind of picture what's going on. <clears throat> Judas had already made a deal with the religious leaders and said, you know, you're not going to be able to go and uh, arrest Jesus with the crowds all around. They're, they're going to they're gonna kill you. So I've got a way, and if you pay me, I've got a way that I can turn him over to you. Would you think that's evil enough? But then Judas goes back after he's made this deal and sits down with the most intimate meal that Jesus said, I desire to share this with you. And we know that he washed all their feet and then he comes to the table. Just blows me away, just the evil of, that's why, what is it and What's the lowest level? Is it Dante's in front of the lowest level of hell is Judas? It's betrayal. It's this how evil it is to actually gain someone's trust and then betray them. Um, that's not a biblical thing. That's just in my head. Like, you get it, right? Like, okay. During, during Passover, a child would say this. Why is this night different than any other night? And then the answer would be, we were slaves. We were slaves in Egypt. Pharaoh would not let God's people go. And so Moses was there, and he kept saying it, and God sent plague after plague after plague until the last one. And God said, on that same night, I will pass through Egypt, listen, and strike down every firstborn of both people and animals, and I will bring judgment on all of the gods of Egypt. I am the Lord. Judgment is coming, is what God said. And the blood will be a sign for you on the houses where you are. And when I see the blood, I will pass over you. If there's blood, no destructive, no destructive plague will touch you when I strike Egypt. This is the angel of death. This is a mini judgment kind of foreshadowing the ultimate judgment. It, it's a picture of divine justice. This was divine justice. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And I want to say this because I know it's going to be hard to see. Do we see the grace in this? We see it in a couple of ways. And you're like, how in the world can you see grace? Well, God only kills the firstborn. Instead of everybody. Because Everyone deserves this punishment. It should have been everyone, but the firstborn is going to be the representative. Sometimes just you can't even imagine what this night would have been like. And God shows his grace to his people who believe if they will take and kill a lamb, as a representative of them. And, you know, I, I, I kind of kept thinking about this, and I was like, why, why is it a lamb, and why is it a, a lamb without blemish? And 
you know, why can't it be like, I don't know, a hyena? Something like you want to kill. I don't know if you've ever seen one of them. Um, when I was in Africa, they were like, they would make these like awful noises. And I, there were, or, or like a warthog. Have you ever seen one of those? Like, you, like, I remember when the, the, uh, the one came through our thing and they tear up everything and the Maasai killed it and, and they wouldn't eat it, but they cooked it and, and figured, well, you people eat pigs, maybe you want this. Well, it didn't taste good. Um, but why does it have to be something, per, why can't it be a sickly lamb? Like, it's going to die anyway. I don't know, that's just my thoughts, Okay. <laughs> And then I want you to put the blood of the lamb on the doorpost. And then there's a very specific thing you're going to do. You're going to eat in a certain way. And then after this, you're going to every year do the same thing again so that you won't forget. So to this day, there are homes where they do this every year and have this. And I want you to eat together with your family and wait to be free. Take shelter under the blood of the lamb. And if you do, the angel of death will pass over you. See, see, the lamb dies instead of the firstborn. And if we, I know this is hard. If we don't understand that we actually do deserve to die, we're never going to understand the cross we we'll never understand what Jesus did for us. See, see, do you see what this is doing? What the Apostle Paul is telling us, what he's telling the Corinthian church, and he's telling us, is he's relating it to the past, to the past when Jesus was with his disciples, but Jesus is relating it to the past, and he was like, all of these things were going to ultimately point to what I'm getting ready to do now. Jesus changes everything. Jesus could have said, like Moses, this is the bread of our affliction that we ate in the wilderness, right? But Jesus took the bread and he broke it and he said, this is my affliction broken for you. And when he took the cup of redemption, he said, this is my blood shed for the remission of sins. See, at the Last Supper, do you, do you notice there's something not at the Last Supper? There's not a lamb on the table because the lamb was at the table. There's not a lamb on the table. And there's a reason why. I, Isaiah says in Isaiah 53, all we like sheep have gone astray and each of us have turned to his own way and the Lord has laid on him, meaning Jesus, the iniquity of us all. Jesus was oppressed and afflicted yet he didn't open his mouth. Jesus was led like a lamb to the slaughter. Isaiah calls him the, the suffering servant. The point is Isaiah and all the other prophets are saying those, those lambs were only a picture. And, and you know what? This was, this was hard because just thinking about what was going on in the first century when Jesus was actually doing this, there were tens of thousands of lambs coming in. And so you had this one-year-old perfect unblemished lamb. You and your family brought it and then you would lay your hands on it. And so the priest would be there, and you're laying your hands on it, would actually represent, okay, I deserve this, but the lamb is going to get it. And some say that it wasn't just a matter of laying hands. One commentator said they would actually put their bot, like lay on the lamb. They were holding the lambs. This should be me. And I'm representing the people that I brought with me. This should be me. And then the priest would come by and slit the throat. Now, Whoa, that is like graphic. And you just think thousands of this is happening. I mean, this is bloody and awful and such a picture of sin. But those lambs were just a representative. There needed to be a real substitute. There needed to be a, a man. Someone like us, and I've said this so many times, someone like us, but someone not like us. And the night on which Jesus was betrayed, he sang, I am the lamb. This is a night unlike any other night, because when Jesus said, this is my body, this is my blood, I am the lamb that takes away the sins of the world. I'm the one. My death is is the event towards which everything in history and salvation has been moving until now. 
Every sacrifice, every liberation, every freedom, every prophet, every priest, every king, every deliverer has all been pointing to me. Because tonight Jesus said, I'm not going to just deliver you from this or that kind of slavery. Some, it's not just physical or social or economical, some kind of partial problem. I'm going to deal with all of the problems of sin and death tonight. That's what I'm doing tonight. This is a night like any other night. So when we take this bread, we take this cup, there's a direct connection between us and what Jesus did at that Last Supper, and another connection to what God did for his people when they were in slaves in Egypt. And we need to remember that. And those things are the things that change us. And, th and then it says, in the same way, after the supper, he took the cup saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. And then whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. So something amazing is going on at this. This last supper with his disciples. Can you, can you imagine? I mean, I just think about this. This is a, a powerful thing. Jesus said, I desired to sit down and do this with you. Jesus had told them, Way before this, in John chapter 6, Jesus said to them, I tell you the truth, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you will have no life in you. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him up at the last day. For my flesh is, my, is real food and my blood is real drink. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood remains in me and I in him. Just as the living Father sent me, and I live because of the Father so the one who feeds on me will live because of me. This is powerful because this is connecting us with the Father. This is food that nourishes us, who we are. Do you want, do you want to live? Then come to the table. And if we find ourselves looking at the circumstances of life and we're, we're bitter or we're despondent or we're filled with anxiety, I think it's because we're not really believing what we're saying we believe when we come to the table. That we are so valued that Jesus was willing to come. We need to remember, we need to eat, we need to digest it, we need to think about it, we need to let it become part of us, we need to let it saturate us. It needs to shape all the ways that we think. And I believe that in John chapter 6 is promising that in a unique way, different than other ways. We eat and drink his words, his truth, the gospel. It becomes part of who we are. It changes us. Do you want to be changed? Do you want to grow? Do you want to use this as one of the means that God gives us to grow? So the Lord's Supper, if you remember the past and get that connection, will mean Jesus with us, in our hands, in our heart, in our life. This is my body. This is my blood. Now, I get this. I get this because, I mean, me just reading it. Now, imagine you didn't grow up in church or hearing this and somebody was reading what I just read in John chapter 6 about Jesus. I mean, it just sounds like. What, what is going on? Why in the world is all the blood and the gore? Like, we live in such a, if you ask most, most kids, right, where does food come from? What are they going to say? The store, right? And you open it up, it's in a box or in a bag. Now, now, most cultures, up until what, probably the last like 75 years, no, food came from, we went and dug it out of the ground or we killed it and butchered it up. Um, why is all this necessary? Why all this, you know, why can't God just forgive? I've heard that, man, I don't know how many times. Why, you know, why can't we just get to like the, the end of time and we all stand before God and he just goes, you know what, every, you're just forgiven. He's a forgiving God. Why doesn't he just say, I'll forgive you? Now listen, I want us to think about it for a second. If someone really, really wrongs us, really hurts us, and it's probably really easy. If you just sat there for a minute, you could probably 
just think of thing after thing after thing of, of someone really betraying you, um, someone really doing something. I remember a couple weeks ago I gave the illustration of the guy beating the car to death, you know, and the policeman said, why don't, yeah, you don't remember, okay. Um, but somebody really betrays you. There's a couple things you could do, right? The first thing is you could just let that evil come in you, right? You're, you're resentful, you think it, you're driving along, you're thinking about, you know what I should have said? And you're starting to think of things you could have said to hurt them back or things that you could do. No, you're looking at me like, oh, I would never do that. You've never sat and had an argument when you're all by yourself in the car? No? So you're laughing, so you have done it a little bit. Okay. Right? We could let that do, and we could let that evil thing that happened, because it was evil, and we could let that sit, and we could digest that, and we could eat that, and we could let it make us bitter and resentful and hard and cold. Or we could forgive them. But I want you to try to do this. Why don't you just say, you've been hurt, betrayed. I forgive you. I want you to, no, I want you to think about that for a second. Just go, you, think about that situation and go, I forgive you. It's not easy, is it? To really do it, I mean. Somebody wronged me, I forgave them, it was no big deal. Well, one of two things, either they really didn't wrong you or you really didn't forgive them and you're just saying it. But if you really, really forgive them, if someone really did something, I want you, I want you to try to do that today. Think about that. Because one, one commentator said, words are not the currency of forgiveness. If you're going to forgive someone when you want to see them pay, but you forgive, you refrain from hurting them. You refrain from beating them up in your car by yourself. <laughs> you refrain from vengeance. You refrain from bad thoughts about them or having ill will in your heart or gossiping about them or, or you just shun them, right? You just don't talk to them. You just avoid them. And we'll see this in a minute. So instead, oh, you know, they're going out that door. Well, I'm going to go out this door because I don't want to. You refrain from slandering them or hurting the reputation. And you know it's hard. It'll be agonizing. I remember calling Mr. Weaver. Man, this is hard. And someone did do that. I mean, it was, I was really young. I was really young, but I was still a, uh, I was a dad, I remember that, because I remember this guy had said some things, and then he had said it to lots of people, and I mean, I was like angry, and I didn't, Mr. Weaver's a guy that I lived with when I was in college, I I don't know if to catch you guys up, well, godly, godly man, and I just called him, and I was like, Mr. Weaver, he did this, and he said this, and, and like, I'm going through this whole story, and he let me just vent on the phone, like, I'm just... Um, he goes, well, Tony, what do you think you should do? Bam. Oh, man. It's like a punch in the gut. Because as soon as he said it, right, as soon as Mr. Tony, Tony, what do you think you should do? Right? He, he, I told him the things that he said. And, and I said, um, I, should, I should forgive him. Are, are you going to be able to do that? Because I guess it sounded like I was pretty upset on the phone. And um, I remember the next Sunday. Because I really wanted to see if I was really going to be able to do what I knew Jesus wanted me to do. And what this godly man, he didn't even have to say you should forgive him. All he did was put the question out there. Well, what do you think you should do about it? Like, you could try to get him back, right? You could try to defend yourself, whatever it is. And I remember going to church that next Sunday. And I saw him. And I walked over and shook his hand and actually sat down beside him. 
for the service. It, it, is, it is emotional to really do it. But here, here's what's weird. If someone is wrong and they've hurt you or betrayed you or done something, you suffer. But if you let that go and you hold on to the evil, the evil comes in us. But if you try to forgive them, you suffer. But evil loses then if you forgive. It ends. Do you see? Do you see? It ends. If you forgive, you suffer, but evil ends. The only way to forgive somebody is to refrain, stop, it hurts, it's agony. Because the currency of forgiveness, like the commentator said, is not words. It's nails and thorns and blood and tears. Here's, here's where we stand. If you and I, in all our own sin, if we can't imagine forgiving without suffering, why in the world do we think that we could place God and say he should just forgive and let it go, knowing what evil we've done? Okay, that knows a little preachy, but go, right? So it unites us now to the past, but it also unites our souls to God, and it also unites us together. And how, how does it unite me and you? The, the Lord's table should be the thing that unifies us when we come to it. Um, as a matter of fact, there, there's a big problem that's going on in the church in Corinth, right? He's, the Apostle Paul said, in the first place, I hear that when you come together as a church, there are divisions among you. And to some extent, I believe it. No doubt there are differences among you, and you show which you have God's approval when you come together. It is not the Lord's Supper you eat. For as you eat, each of you goes ahead without waiting for anybody else. One remains hungry. Another gets drunk. One commentator said, the thing about the Corinthians, <laughs> he said, we're so happy the Corinthian church was such a mess. And I'm like, I don't know where this is going, right? Because... It was, if it wasn't such a mess, Paul wouldn't have had to write all the things interesting to the church to fix it. And we would not have known many of the things that we know now. Because if you read 1 Corinthians 11, it's a lot about the Lord's table. The early church was a mess. Okay, but you know what? We're a mess. Come on. We're, no, we're not a mess? Okay. We learn about the Lord's Supper it was a mess. There was divisions. There was tremendous divisions. If you go back and read, Paul is all over the place. So somebody is writing to Paul, and here's the things that are going on. What should we do? And he does a lot of yes, but, yes, but, yes, but, all throughout it, right? Okay, I understand the problem, but here's what you guys need to do. I understand the problem, but here's what you guys need to do. Um, there was a lot of strife. There was a lot of conflict. There was a lot of divisions, and the Apostle Paul is trying to deal with this in this chapter, and then he's going to keep going. And one of the things that I learned in study of this, um, D.A. Carson, he, he said, um, you have to realize that at this point, they're still running on a 10-day calendar. So you have to look that up. Now you're curious, right? But the people of God were celebrating on a 7-day calendar. So... There's work time in, so a lot of these early churches, especially in places like Rome and in Corinth, they would have had their service at night. Now, here's where the division thing came in. So there's different groups of people, right, that have become Christians, and they're gathered together, but there's still this kind of separate attitude, right? There were some business owners, so they got there early, right, because they own the business, and they got a big, giant picnic basket, Full of stuff, right? And obviously, some good wine is in their basket and they're eating. And then a little later on, and here, here's what the commentator said, the workers, the people that, were, that work for businesses, they came along. But they only had, you know, like chicken sandwich. They had like a paper bag lunch. 
They didn't have a big picnic basket, but they, and they came along in their ideas. But then, do you know what were in the early church? There was a lot of slaves that were in the early church, but they couldn't like take food from who they worked for. So a lot of times they came hungry. Now, what should happen? Well, we should share. I like it when we all eat together and I get to share all the things y'all have made. No. Um, but the, the church then, how, how unified is this problem then? So then when they come to the Lord's table, there's some people that are hungry. Some people are tipsy already. I said this last week. Do people in the church hurt us sometimes? Yeah. Does that mean we just give up on the church? No, right? One pastor said, some of the people came and it was so disdainful that when they got to the Lord's Supper, they had gobbled down their food and they left early and there were other people that didn't have enough. But it was supposed to be a community meal. They were supposed to be sharing. And Paul's response is some of the harshest language in the New Testament. Man, I wish I had another. You call this, this is not the Lord's table. This is not the Lord's supper, he's telling the church. But does, does, does Paul say this? Does Paul say, you know what, you guys just got to break up. Down south, this means yes. I don't know. Does that, is that what Paul says or no? No. Does he tell the stronger Christians, you know what? You see all the problems. You just leave. No. And he doesn't tell them to sit in the corner and be in judgment on everybody else. See, we didn't do it earlier in the letter. Some people are saying, oh, I am follow Paul. And then other people are like, no, I follow Apollos. And then the real, you know, spiritual ones. They're like, no, no, I follow Jesus. Oh, you're, you're the most spiritual then. You just waited until you heard everybody's answer. Um, <laughs> that was just funny in my own head. Um, but he doesn't. He doesn't. He said this, though. If you eat and drink the cup of the Lord like this, you're bringing judgment on yourself. And you got to remember the two connecting stories. Back to those lambs. For anyone who drinks and eats without recognizing the body of the Lord, without remembering that you are part of a body, that I have put you in a family, if you forget that, you bring judgment on yourself. And, and Paul is really upset. And he goes, because you know what? Because you're not understanding the heart of the gospel. We all are sinful and we deserve judgment. That's why we're coming to the table. Do you get that? So if we think somehow I'm better than somebody else, we're missing the point of why we're coming to the table. That makes sense, right? Like now that I'm saying it out loud, boy, it really is silly of me to think because I'm wealthy that somehow I'm better so I could just take my basket and leave everybody else out. No. We're all sinners saved by grace. Our performance doesn't matter. Our pedigree doesn't matter. In Christ, there is no slave or free. There's no Jew or Greek. There is no male or female. All of that stuff doesn't matter. But if we're holding on to that, that's the things that's causing divisions, this pride, this class envy, racial envy, all that is going on. And if there's divisions among you, how dare you? How dare you take? That's what Paul is saying. That means there needs to be grace. There needs to be grace in relationships. There needs to be forgiveness. There needs to be unity. And if there's someone that we're still mad at, that we're not talking to, that we're avoiding because we're holding on to that. I remember uh, one of my professors, and I loved him. Dr. Belcher was so, he was so awesome. He was, um, he was a old-time Southern Baptist uh, pastor, but he was also a professor. And um, he wrote a, a whole bunch of uh, novels, um, and they were really kind of fun to read. He wrote them from, I think, I think they were kind of his own 
you know, personal perspective as a young pastor and then as a seminary professor. And, um, but I remember, um, this is, now this is, he would have started probably in the 50s. And this was the mid 80s when I knew him. And he would be asked to speak all different uh, churches all around down south. And he was and really a great communicator. And one of the things that he would al- always do when, and he would tell us about this in class, he would always um, take, take with him uh, a couple of the uh, black seminary students that were studying to be pastors when he would go preach. Okay, is anybody tracking with me? This is the 50s, the 60s, the 70s in South Carolina at a Baptist church. No, nobody's tracking with me. Okay, what happened in the South? <laughs> and he would say, I mean, he, had, he said it, I remember in class, he said, yeah, some deacons came to me and said, and he just opened the Bible and let them have it. And then he said, one church, he was like, why is it? There seemed to be, he is, I, I just, I'd, I'd preached there a few times before, but there seemed to be something that was going on. So he asked one of the deacons before the service, hey, you know, there was like definitely some tension. And he goes, oh yes, the two sisters. He goes, what, what do you mean, the two sisters? Oh, something, something happened like 25 years ago, and they don't talk to each other. And one comes in, and she sits down on this side, and one comes in, and she sits down on this side. And he goes, oh, well, he changed his whole sermon that day. And <laughs> because he's like, we, we got to preach what the Bible says, and there's got to be some boldness. There has to be unity within the brothers and sisters of Christ. There's no slave or free, Jew, Gentile, male, female. No, there's none of that. As a matter of fact, we're going to see this at the end. When we all get to heaven, every tribe, every race, every tongue, it, it, guys, it's going to be amazing. So if we, if we really realize we're not better than anybody else, we're coming to the table because Jesus had to die, and he had to die because we're sinful. So if we have a bad relationship with somebody, what we need to do is we need to repent. We need to remember. Now, how, how do we come, though? You know, because we don't want to come in an unworthy manner. Well, do you, do you want to know what a worthy manner is? It's not that you think, okay, well, I did good this week. I had my quiet time every day. Uh, I listened to Pastor Tony's sermons over and over again to make sure that I was following the me. No, 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 no. You know what coming is? <laughs> Knowing that we need to come. Knowing that we're so sinful that we needed Jesus and coming in the worthy manner would be recognizing that, going, I am sinful and need forgiveness and I'm trusting Jesus and Jesus alone to be able to do that. I know, I know that's, 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 there's so, maybe I should have just done part one and part two. I still have way more to go. Um, you're, you're with me though, right? Because I, I can't just stop. I gotta, I gotta, because, because it, it unites, it unites us from here to the past. It, it unites us to God. It unites us with each other, me and you together, but it also it, it unites us to this future. And I, I just keep looking at different art and, and like people trying to capture w- what this future looks like because Jesus talks about it and there's this future in Revelation. It says, then I, I heard what sounded like a great multitude like the roar of rushing waters and like loud pearls of thunder shouting hallelujah for our Lord God almighty reigns. Let us rejoice and be glad and give him glory for the wedding of the lamb has come and his bride has made herself ready. Fine linen, bright, clean was given to her. Then the angel said to me, write this, blessed are those who are invited to the wedding supper of the lamb. And he added, these are the true words of God. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, now the dwelling of God is with men and he will live with them. They will be his people and God himself will be with them and be their God. And he will wipe away every tear. 
And there'll be no more death and no more mourning or crying or pain for the old order of things have passed away. I am making all things new. There is going to be, and Jesus said from when then, I'm not going to eat this again until then with everybody, all those who've trusted me. So we get to the new heavens and the new earth. It's a supper like any other supper. The pain's gone. The crying's gone. The tears are gone. All those longings of her heart. There'll be no divisions. There'll be no sin. There'll be no emptiness. And what this is, is we're getting a taste. A taste of then. And Jesus is saying, I am unconditionally committed to getting you from here to there. I was was reading... I couldn't find it sung, but it's called A Shocking Thing. And it was a communion hymn, the, but with the lyrics um, by D.A. Carson. So there's this theologian that wrote this, and I wanted to remember it. And it said, remember my tears, Gethsemane's fears. Recall that my followers fled, that I was betrayed, disowned, and arraigned. The prince of life, crucified, dead. Remember your shame, your sin, and your blame. Remember the blood that I shed. While breaking the bread, the Lord Jesus said, do this in remembrance of me. While lifting the cup, the Savior spoke up, do this in remembrance of me. Do this in remembrance of me. And I thought, that is amazing. Remembering, right? And so... The horns of Rohan are blowing, right? And it says in the Lord of the Rings book, not in the movie, we're told for the rest of his life, when Pippin heard any horn, he would break into tears because he remembered. It was an audible reminder of him being rescued that day. It connected him to the past. This is something tangible, like a palatable horn, something you hear, something you taste, something that you see. It will connect us to the one who sacrificed and died to save us. Do we believe Do we trust and are we remembering? Let's pray. Oh, thank you, Father. That's what the sacred supper means. This is a feast of gratitude. Father, (laughs) the only people who are unworthy to eat are people who don't think they're sinners saved by grace. To think you are worthy. We come and we ask that you would help us to remember and to feed on your words because they are spirit and they are life. Help us to remember because we know it will change us and help us to grow. And Father, if there's someone here and they've been listening, mm, just give them eyes to see that Jesus is the Lamb that was slain and that we come and take his body and his blood. We remember. Amen.